This video is going to introduce us to bivariate plots in R with the library ggplot2. There should be a 2 there. Let's add one. Uh, now, we're moving towards bivariate plots. That means plots with two variables. Now, this is building upon all of our work with plots with one variable. Mostly, we've looked at histograms and density plots, which are both single variable plots where the one variable is numeric. We're now moving up to uh, two variable plots where visually what we're going to try to do is compare means amongst different groups. Now, if we have different groups, those are going to be specified by the levels of a categorical variable. So that means one categorical variable can take on many different values, and we're going to almost always put those on the x-axis, the levels of the categorical variable will go on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, this is where we will actually calculate some means. On the y-axis, we'll put the numeric variable. We can add up and divide by however many there are uh, for numeric data. So that will be the uh, variable on the y-axis. And we're working our way in this class towards modeling as well. So I'm just going to point out here and then again in future lectures that when we compare the means across two, specifically two groups, that is one categorical variable with two levels defining two different groups, when we compare the means across two groups, this is often known as a two-sample t-test. So I can see my notes here need a little separation to help you understand how my writing is going here. We're not going to highlight that now, I'm just kind of noting it so that we have experience with the language as many times as we can through these lectures. And specifically, when there's more than two groups, they call this analysis of variance, which the uh, capital letters A-N-O-V, read ANOVA, stands for. Analysis of variance is ironically named, but the uh, statistical test that measures the means across more than two groups. Again, I'm just highlighting those names so that we can hear them as much as possible. But really, the way I've structured this course, uh, those are not going to have any special meaning to us uh, in our modeling process. So, as we work towards comparing uh, means amongst groups, we are going to have many different plotting options. We are going to look at jitter plots, we will look at box plots, and violin plots. Now generally, but not always, those are plots of the population distribution. Now remember, when we're getting towards our modeling here, we're separating out the population distribution from the sampling distribution. So we're going to have to keep that in mind, and I'm trying to help you remember that as we move forward here. So those three plots on the left are generally, but not always, uh, describing the population. And then we'll look at one last plot, which is a plot that represents the mean and confidence intervals about the mean, or you know, pick a percentage for a confidence interval. And uh, we will plot that as well. And generally, when we're plotting means and confidence intervals, that is representing the sampling distribution. Okay, all of the lecture from here on out will be in R, so let's just jump right to it. We are going to be making some plots, so I will load the library, ggplot, there's the two. We're going to be using the donkeys data set from my GitHub repository under my username, Raldis, and the uh, data set is just named donkeys. Now, when you go find that URL, I'm going to remind you that you should get the uh, link to the raw CSV file, so that'll take just a second of work. And if you want, you can go ahead and read about the data set in the readme file up on the GitHub repository. But mostly, we're just going to be looking at various measures of donkeys. Uh, we can look at girth, height, 
length and weight, I think, across the um, levels of the categorical variable sex. So I will let you pause and go read about this data set on your own while I just keep it moving. So here we go. We are going to start in the order we had in the outline where we are going to do bivariate plots of the population distribution. Now it starts out pretty much as we've seen before, except inside the aesthetic, we are now going to put the categorical variable sex on the x-axis. And let's just go with height of the donkeys on the y-axis. Now, if the units look a little weird to you, it's because I believe height is measured in hands. I don't know whose hand is the standard hand, but this is an honest way that people measure the height of horse-like animals is just by stacking their hands up to the shoulder, I believe it is. So we are going to put sex, the categorical variable, on the x-axis, height, the numerical variable, on the y-axis, and we are going to start with a scatter plot, and then I'm going to show you why. My bad. I'm going to start with a scatter plot, which comes from the geometry named point, and I'm going to show you why this is not a great choice for this plot. Now, if you look down here on the x-axis, you can see that there are three levels of the categorical variable sex. I will let you, in your own time, figure out what gelding means. And here is height, the numerical variable on the y-axis. The awkward thing about this plot is it just stacks the points, and we don't know how many points there are, how many observations there are represented by this one point. If multiple horses uh, multiple donkeys had a height of 90, then it would just overlay a bunch of points right there. So we don't know, looking at this, um, how many observations we really have from this plot. The better choice in this case is often the geometry jitter, where you can add some horizontal by default, it's only horizontal noise to the observations, such that we can see better almost how, or we can see better that we have many observations here in this data set. So we're still getting much of the same information on the y-axis out, and by jittering, it's called, adding random noise to in the x-axis direction, we can see much better that we have a lot of data here, and most of it, at least for females, is centered around a mean of about 100, maybe just a little bit shy. So jitter is particularly good. An option you will often like with jitter is the um, alpha option. It's an option named alpha. And what it does is shades the um, observation or makes them transparent. Uh, and this is particularly good when you have a ton of data, some tens of thousands of points, because uh, by the thickness of the coloring, after making them transparent, you can kind of gather like, oh look, there's a lot of observations kind of clustered right around here near 100, but it's really fairly thin out here down near 90. Okay, so jitter is pretty good. Each observation is a particular horse, it measures on the y-axis, and is relative to a particular level of the categorical explanatory variable uh, sex. You can also do, and I'm just going to start adding these plots on here to make for one really fancy plot, such that we demonstrate that you can literally just add new layers onto a plot as you go. For the box plot, what we get is this fancy plot representing the summary statistics of each level's observations. Now, let's start with gelding. Working your way from gelding up the plot, this vertical bar here is called the lower whisker, 
and I'll skip for now the exact definition of the lower whisker. Let's just know that the whiskers, lower and upper, help you visualize uh, skew in the data. So because these two whiskers, the upper and lower, are largely the same length, the skew for the gelding's height is almost non-existent. Okay, next up is this lower bar, this horizontal lower bar. That is the first quartile, and quartiles are just fancy names for percentiles. So you can think of quarter, by quarter, uh, is splitting up the percentiles into quarters. So the first quartile is just the 25th percentile. So we read that the 25th percentile of height for geldings is just above 100. From just above 100 and down is about 25% of the data. Okay, so this is the first quartile. This is the second quartile in the middle, that uh, a little bit thicker bar is the second quartile or the 50th percentile. So that means from this point down is about 50% of the data and from this point up is about 50% of the data. This top horizontal bar is the third quartile or the 75th percentile. And if there are any suspected outliers, and I really stress the term suspected outliers because outliers are tricky to define, they will go outside of the whiskers. So you can see gelding really only seems to have a small number of outliers. Again, we don't know. Uh, I guess that's just one observation here. It's going to be that one, but with no horizontal noise, it'll be just directly above gelding. But you can see over here for like female, or stallion, there are a number of suspected outliers below the lower whisker. Now I've chosen fill equals to NA, that is you can see all the way through the box plot. Get rid of that if you want to see what happens, but I like to see all of the observations that I can on this plot as I'm working with these extra summary statistics like box plots. Box plots, uh, as we just saw, basically provide a good number of summary statistics, basically percentiles, kind of stacked in a meaningful way. But what we've seen more often is density plots of numeric variables, and we can get that with violin plots. Now let's just give these a little bit of color so that we can highlight them as we go. And these violin plots showing up in blue are essentially horizontal, uh, like, yeah, horizontally shifted, or however you want to think of that, density plots. And then they have like a top and bottom. There really isn't much to the top and bottom. It's just kind of a symmetric density plot split out in both directions. And you can see ggplot really nicely just adds box plots or... Uh, violin plots by each level of the categorical explanatory variable sex. If you want to clean this up a little bit, you could specify a smaller width for the box plot, and it kind of nicely inlays the box plot within the density plot represented by the layer violin. And this is a really easy way to make bivariate plots in R. I actually like, if it's not too cluttered, to show all of these layers anytime I'm making such a bivariate plot with a numeric variable on the y-axis and categorical variable on the x-axis. In this way, it's really easy to see that basically the heights, the mean height between female, gelding, and stallion is basically the same for all levels of the categorical variable sex for donkeys. What's great about the library ggplot2 is you can very easily just change the y-axis numeric variable. Let's just change it to girth, and we can get the same idea as before, except now we see that because of this one potential outlier down here for stallions, there is a lot of, uh, and you got to be careful here, this is left 
skew in the girth of stallions. This is left skew. But despite the left skew, there really seems to be about the same mean for all of these levels of the categorical variable sex for both girth and height, in fact. This one plot gives you a really good sense of the mean and the standard deviation for each level of the categorical variable sex with respect to your numerical variable on the y-axis. Now you got to remember that these are all basically plots representing the population distribution. So we should be able to convince um, ggplot to do bivariate plots of the sampling distribution. And there's a uh, sub package that sometimes gets installed with ggplot2 and sometimes doesn't. So let's just call install.packages on the library hmiss. Oops, and it might ask you to do some funny stuff. Okay, here it goes. We're installing the library hmiss. If you don't have it, this is a great time to do it. It'll really help for making bivariate plots representing sampling distributions. We'll start out basically the same way as above, but then instead of any of the other layers, what we're going to do is add summary statistics with the ggplot2 function stat underscore summary. And onto the data, we will calculate, and this is in quotes, I know it's a little weird, confidence limits calculated from the bootstrap. So we're going to get mean and confidence limits calculated from the bootstrap. And what we get out is, oh, don't forget, we just restarted R, so we got to reload our library and reload our data set. What we get out now is almost a zoomed in plot where the points are the means of each level with respect to the numeric variable on the y-axis and the bars by default are bootstrap estimates of 95% confidence intervals. By default, the confidence intervals are 95% when you use this function that ggplot2 uh, borrows from the library hmiss. Now you can do fancy things like add all of the observations onto this plot if you want, but you'll notice that the, like we've seen before, the population distribution and the sampling distribution are on vastly different scales. So although we're still plotting confidence intervals with this layer, they almost disappear because they're so small relative to the width of the population distribution. So I particularly like this plot because it reminds us that we're trying to compare means across the levels of a categorical variable. Now, for the next lecture, Let's just not preface it in case I ever want to change the order that these things go in. So this was a good introduction in bivariate plots using the library ggplot2. I hope you enjoyed it.